Good afternoon, and thanks for coming to our panel, which focuses on teaching clarinet students in their first three years on the instrument. Each of us will cover one topic briefly, and we'll also provide a handout which elaborates on all of our topics and also includes a list of solos for students in their first three years. You'll be hearing from Dr. Karen Bronson on the formation of embouchure and early stages of tone production, myself, Dr. Ellen Kaner, on a thoughtful approach to rhythm, Dr. Madeline Moore, who will talk about tonguing and considerations of articulation in those early years, Vicki Ramos Dressel, who will talk about beginning a student on hand position and working on technique in the early stages, and Sharon Doobie will talk about the selection of equipment. We all agree that young students should have high quality instruction in those early years with a thoughtful plan of action rather than wait to get older students and try to untangle a lot of bad habits. We hope you enjoy our session. I'm gonna share with you some embouchure exercises that I do with my beginning clarinet students. So first of all, what is the embouchure? The embouchure is all the muscles that we use to create a beautiful sound. So we can define our embouchure in two ways. We have our external and the internal. We have for the external, we have our lips, our chin, cheek, and jaw. The internal is the teeth, tongue, hard and soft palate, and the throat. So as educators, we need to address all of these so that our students can create a beautiful tone. So first, let's do a muscle awareness exercise. For the upper lip, I get my thumb and I put it on my top teeth and say, ooh, ooh. So what I notice with that is that my upper lip is engaged, but it's really the sides of my upper lip that are coming in. Um, so that's a great uh, upper lip awareness exercise, lower lip. Just, I put it over my teeth and rub on my lower lip and it should be flat, just like I'm putting on a lip moisturizer. A fun one to do for the corners is what I call pinky pushes. Put my pinkies up, put them in my mouth and push my corners in towards the pinkies and I'll feel that resistance. Another exercise that I like to do is with straws. You can use a drinking straw or a milkshake straw like this one. But put it in your mouth, cover the other end, and suck in. And then I remove my finger and you can hear a pop noise. So do that several times and then do it the opposite way where you're blowing out. So you want students to feel the same, whether they're sucking in or, or blowing out. Uh, another exercise I like to do is with balloons. So you want to try to blow up a balloon without your cheeks puffing out. If the student's cheeks puff out, a lot of times that's because their tongue is too low in their mouth. So if they can blow it up like that, without the cheeks puffing out, then that's your goal. Plus they always have fun with those. Something else that you can do is uh, attach two straws together and put the balloon on the end and blow through that. That's a really effective way to do that because you notice you notice that there's more, a lot more resistance there. Something else I like to do with balloons is attach it to a mouthpiece or I'll, sometimes I'll do mouthpiece and barrel but it fits better on the mouthpiece and you can have them blow like that. Remember, you don't want the cheeks to puff out. For the internal embouchure, to set the teeth right, I have them put get a piece of paper, put it between the mouthpiece and the reed, where the two connect is called the fulcrum point. And that's right where we wanna have our lip. So then I'll get a pen and draw that across the reed. And that is where we want our lower lip to be. So I'll put my finger to the side of that. Top teeth on, lower lip right there. Yeah. 
To work on voicing involves raising the soft palate in the back of the roof of the mouth. To do so, Robert Marcellus would have his students whistle three different pitches for the three different registers of the clarinet. For the Chalumeau register, he would have them whistle a clarinet A flat. For the clarion register, they would whistle a clarinet B. And for the altissimo register, a clarinet C sharp. By whistling these three pitches, it shapes the oral cavity to be just the right shape to properly voice these notes. I hope you've enjoyed all these exercises. For more exercises, refer to the PDF. Thank you. Hello again. I've noticed in my career of over 40 years of teaching that I've received more tips either at conferences like this or from colleagues that I've taught with. So I'm going to steal a little from, with permission, from a colleague named Larry Barton, um, whom I taught with in the Grand Prairie Independent School District for a number of years, because I think that his thorough approach to rhythm is the best that I've seen. So the important things here are teaching the student to look at the rhythm first when presented with a line or song or piece of music, to deal with just one element at a time, and to use this more detailed approach to subdivision. So the three main steps are listed here, count and clap, clap a name, and name and finger, although there are other steps that I'll refer to briefly. So on this first example, most people who aren't using this more detailed approach would just say one, three, one, Take three, but we're going to divide up the half notes and dotted quarter. So we're going to say one, te, two, te, three, te, four, te, one, te, two, te, three, te, four, te. And then we're going to clap a name so the student deals with the note names before they pick up the instrument and also try to finger those notes. So they're going to say C, te, two, te, D, te, four, te, E, te, to D, C, T, four, T, and then they're going to pick up their clarinet and finger and say the very same thing, C, T, to T, D, T, four, T, E, T, to D, C, T, four, T. And then after those three steps, there's the option of maybe playing the spot on the mouthpiece and barrel or go on to play it on the whole clarinet. So then we have a couple of examples that have a couple of noteworthy pitfalls, such as starting with a dotted quarter or having a rest right in the middle of things. So here on this second example, starting with the dotted quarter F, we would say one te two te three te four te one te two te three te four te so notice that i did say something during the rest but i had my hands apart indicating that there would be no sound during the rest and then i would clap a name f te two g a te g te f te two te rest te g te and then fingering on my clarinet, I would also say that rest out loud. F T two G A T G T F T two T rest T G T. The next example, even more dangerous, we're starting with an even longer value and a rest in the first bar. So we would say one T two T three T four T one T two T three T four T, and then we would say F T two T three T rest T A A G G F T four T, and then we would say the very same thing as we finger on our clarinet, including saying the rest. And then a couple of other quick examples that get a tiny bit more complicated. When you have sixteenths, it's possible to insert another step before step one where you say downs and ups, like down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up, down, up, down, up. And then you follow it with step one, one, two, ta, ta, two, ta, 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 three, ta, four, ta. And then you follow it with the letter names G, 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 A, 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 G, G. 
And just one thing here, it is good to say the sharps are flats when you're naming, but when you get to 16th, you may not want to say like four G sharps in a row. And then one other quick example of the faster type of 6-8 at a slower tempo. And you will say one lolly, two lolly, one lolly, two lolly. And then you will say C lolly, F lolly, E, 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 D lolly. And then you will say the very same thing as you finger it on your clarinet. Hello, my name is Madeline Moore and I'll be talking to you about how I teach articulation to young students. Um, the first thing that I start out with is I tell them tip of the top of the tongue to the tip of the top of the reed. So we then I have them say, say tip of the top of the tongue to the tip of the top of the reed and then tip top tongue. And the part of the tongue that they use to say tip top tongue, that's the amount of tongue that touches the reed. And the reason I use that phrase is it's the tip of the top of the tongue. So not the tip right here, but the tip of the top here. And then not the tip of the reed, but the tip of the top here. Okay, um, then for me, the most important thing, the two most important things for teaching good articulation that will help students develop into stronger clarinet players are keeping the air connected through the tongue and keeping the tongue motion as small as possible. So I gave you in the handout, the second page of it is some tonguing exercises. You may refer to these as mini scales. I do these with my students from the very beginning. As soon as they can play Mary Had a Little Lamb, they play the first tonguing exercise because I think the sooner you get them used to moving their tongue faster than they're comfortable with, the more comfortable they will get with moving their tongue, <laughs> okay? So when you have them learn that first one, Make sure that all the notes are touching. So, not you, if you teach them from the very beginning to really be conscious of that and not let their air get choppy and broken up that way, it will make your life so much easier down the road, both for you and the student. Um, so just really keep that air connected all the time for everyone. Then the next part is I try to teach my students to use as little tongue motion as possible. So I actually prefer the syllable t, T-I-H, to T or ta. And if you look at the handout that I gave you, what I'm trying to describe is most of your tongue, most of this middle part of your tongue in your mouth all along here should be high and still and basically never moves. Then a little bit of your tongue moves and an even smaller bit of your tongue touches the reed. The reason I prefer T is if I say T and my tongue is here, I go T and my tip of my tongue goes T and pulls back and up real far. And when I say ta, my tongue goes ta and dips down a lot. So to me, T, 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 T keeps everything really, really still. Um, that's why I teach that one. So when we're learning these tonguing exercises, I'll have the student pay attention to those three areas on their tongue and say, then we will add air to that without the clarinet. So, etc. Then we put the clarinet on it and practice keeping your tongue exactly the same. And I try to teach the students to listen for variations in their tongue and in their tone, even at the very beginning, because the more aware they are of those things at the beginning, the better they will be later on down the road. Okay? Then with those tonguing exercises, what I do with them is... We start the first one in maybe the second lesson. As soon as they can play Mary Had a Little Lamb, we do that first one. Then we add one every couple of weeks. We start out at quarter equals 60 and gradually speed up. They get harder as you work your way down the page. 
And then when they can play most of them at about 120, we switch the rhythm to eighth notes and 16th notes and drop the tempo back down to 60 and then keep going from there, getting faster and faster. The more comfortable they get moving their tongue quickly at the beginning, the better off for everyone. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments, and I hope to hear from you. Hi, I'm Victoria ramos Dressel, and these are my goddaughters, Victoria and Veronica, who are going to be demonstrating on clarinet for me today. Today, I will be discussing proper hand position and technique for the early years. Veronica is demonstrating our left hand. She has a relaxed hand curved to her fingers and she's using her finger pads to cover the holes and not her fingertips. That is not what we want. Veronica's left thumb is at an angle on the register key where we can, at this angle, just easily push the register key at any moment when we need to start using that. Typically, students in the early years want their finger to be straight, and we want to avoid having that. So we want students to turn their thumb so it's more of that angle. When introducing the A key, we want the students to start learning how to roll that top finger when they're going to from E to A or F sharp to A. So they're getting that rolling action. A lot of times students just start at the E and then pick up their fingers for the A. And so we wanna get them to, instead of doing that, to roll. Victoria is demonstrating our right hand. And for our thumb rest, we want it to be right over the knuckle. We don't want it over the thumbnail, which some students sometimes do. It's going to bring that bad hand position and it's going to be painful and not relaxed. But we also don't want it all the way in. So it's going to be right at the knuckle. Keeping relaxed hand in her right hand, we want curved fingers and we don't want to hold up the instrument with the side keys there, which some younger players do. We want them to use the thumb rest properly and bring that hand to a natural curve. With our pinkies, we wanna keep our, our pinkies above the keys, even if we're not using it. Oftentimes we find students who use, who put their pinkies underneath to support the instrument, either underneath that top row or sometimes even there. So we wanna make sure that the students have the pinky above the keys on both sides, left and right. When students are playing and lifting their fingers, we don't want their fingers to go too high when they are not being used. Overall, we want students to memorize where the fingers go placed on the instrument we don't want them looking down as they're playing. We want to enforce that muscle memory. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Hi, I'm Sharon Duby, and I'm happy to be part of this panel discussion on issues for young players. I've been asked to talk about equipment, and I'll try and give you some key suggestions and ideas I'll also provide some links uh, that will go into more depth uh, beyond what I can do in this video. Um, as you know, there are so many choices for clarinets, mouthpieces, reeds, and ligatures, and it can be a little daunting. So I'll start from the bottom and go up. Um, I usually, for an instrument, like to recommend that you get a good student instrument that's made out of wood. Um, Look for an instrument that has nice resonance. It's very even throughout the registers and it has great intonation throughout the registers. Look for a mouthpiece that will suit that particular clarinet. Find something that is reasonably easy to play, but it's not going to 
um, lose its focus. Try to match the reed with the mouthpiece. You want something that is, again, kind of easy to play, but it should still have good resonance and control. You need to find a ligature that will help the reed respond very well and have good articulation. Um, find a cap that will suit the mouthpiece and ligature because not all of them match up. Other essential equipment that I like to have for my beginners is right away is a, a reed case. Cork grease is important for daily use. Um, a swab that will be easy to use and will clean well. Mouthpiece cushion to help protect the mouthpiece and uh, give more comfort while they're playing. Uh, a neck strap. I like most of my students to have that for stability, but also if a student's instrument does not have an adjustable thumb rest, this will help them a little bit with their hand position and give them more control. Um, in choosing all of this, you want your students to have the best that they can afford at the time. And you want to guide them. Um, they may rent right away or they may purchase or they may be given um, an instrument from a family member. Regardless of how they get that instrument and equipment, you want to check it thoroughly to make sure that everything is in working order and that they have the right um, things for their success. Even a new clarinet sometimes needs adjustments, so just um, try to look at them carefully. Um, when we're talking about mouthpieces, I wanted to point out that you should get familiar with the terminology a little bit of, of the different elements of the mouthpieces. In particular, um, one of the more important things to know is the term facing. The facing is going to determine the tip opening, um, whether it's considered an open or a close mouthpiece. A more open mouthpiece is going to need a little bit softer read, where a close mouthpiece will need a little bit harder read. So um, often I'm going to recommend a medium uh, tip opening and medium facing length for most beginners. It should work fairly well for most, most students. Um, keep in mind that you are able to reach out to not only your local music store for uh, suggestions and help with equipment, but you might reach out to the artists that, that those companies have for clarinets and mouthpieces and reeds. Um, manufacturers may be willing to have a representative come to the school and bring instruments for your students to try um, and um, read and mouthpiece makers um, also uh, will be able to provide um, sometimes some um, artists to come and do a workshop for you and they will be able to let your students try the different materials and may be able to give you some samples. Um, if I can help you in any way, I would be very happy to. You can reach out to me and um, please again look for more detailed information than I could do in this video. Thank you for watching. Hope this helps. Thanks again for choosing to come to our session when you have so many options at Clarinet Fest. We hope that it has been helpful and we encourage you to be in touch with any and all of us. Enjoy the rest of the conference.